My mother told me that she watched the British Army march out of the Athlone Barracks in 1922. Oh, a huge crowd. A huge crowd. You couldn't get through the crowd. There's photographs of them somewhere. And you see a lot of them, the likes of my mother and that, would have known the fellows that were marching in. And it was a very, very, very big deal. The sources that we have um, suggest that it was a joyous day. Now this is obviously before the Civil War, but this is an Irish, the crowd, the reaction to Sean McKeown gave this rip-roaring speech, you could put it, uh, about we have the barracks and now we'll hold it and all this, and you, you can imagine the tenor of his talk. But that was, that was a huge crowd in, in Custom Barracks, and for many people it was the first time they probably never imagined that they would get into there in these circumstances. And, and the general reaction was one of, now, there are storm clouds on the horizon with the split over the treaty, but the general reaction on that day is this is a wonderful event. This celebration in Athlone would seem to be straightforward. They move out, we move in triumphant. But this was only the start of a very turbulent time in Irish and Army history. Within weeks of the celebration, Costume Barracks would witness the treaty split in the IRA ranks. Uh, and you can see those, McKeown is, 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 is very quick to take control. Um, even though he's very limited weapons, to take control of the barracks uh, and the anti-treaty, um, you know, you can still say pro-treaty and anti-treaty IRA at this stage, the anti-treaty IRA are forced out of the barracks and they, up they f form a kind of a bespoke headquarters uh, in a hotel in the centre of the town. It's only a couple of hundred metres from the, the barracks, but for this period before the beginning of the Civil War, uh, you've got these two rival centres of power and it's a question of who's going to emerge victorious. Trouble was inevitable and it blew up over the controversial shooting of General Adamson from Costume Barracks on the streets between the two centres and was used by McKeown as a spur to get the anti-treaty faction to leave town. As worries of a civil war arose, in April 1922, General McKeown was optimistic. The position is daily writing itself. The army is certainly split to some extent, but it will write itself in the course of a few weeks. But in his headquarters in Custom Barracks, his new Irish National Army, as it would be called, was having its own troubles since moving in. What happened was the British Army marked out and the IRA marched in with General Sean McKeown and a lot of she told me a lot of things that happened. One was, the chat was, that the IRA marched in and they were told to polish their boots and salute the officers. And they didn't polish the boots, they kicked the officers and they beat them up. And the consensus was that there was more blood spilt in the barracks in the first fortnight than there was in the entire fight against the army. Young men used to a guerrilla type war were not ready for the rigors of a standing army living in a barracks and all the strictures that required. In, in Beggar's Bush, in the very first barracks that they take over in Dublin, um, an NCO tries to tell the former IRA people what to do. And uh, he says, no, I'm not doing it. And he says, okay, you're on a charge. Takes out a hand grenade <laughs> and points it at him. Says, okay, now, now tell me what to do. You know? Very often, uh, like General McKeown was in charge of them. And uh, many, uh, obviously, were from his own area of Longford. You know what I mean? So. Um, you would have think that there was, um, what do you call, uh, uh, county loyalty, even parish loyalty, you know what I mean? You would, you would have thought that would carry it through. But you're absolutely right. It was trying to bring a group, if you bring a, a diverse group like that, you, you're, um, uh, and that had never experienced the discipline that uh, is required in a situation like that, of course there would, there'd be problems, yeah. During this period, desertions were common, and the officers commanding divisions were in the position that had to regard every officer whose loyalty had not been tried and proved as a possible enemy, or at least a doubtful asset. Sean McKeown had been a guerrilla leader, been quite successful as a guerrilla leader until he was arrested. He would have been executed had it not been for the, for the treaty. Um, but Sean McKeown takes over at throne, and he's well connected, he has the loyalty of the local um, guerrillas and, and quite popular also in the locality like he's elected as a TD as well but a military man he is not you know he doesn't have any experience in an institutional army and so 
The reports that come out of Athlone, and this is only representative of what happens elsewhere, is a great deal of chaos. In the Athlone command, the command staff was indolent, incompetent and incapable, exercising little or no supervision over its subordinate units. The 5th Infantry Battalion, quartered in custom barracks, was the worst of the battalions, and the 23rd Infantry Battalion, Longford, was not far behind it in indiscipline and inefficiency. By 1974, I was talking to a good lot of older officers, and sometimes retired officers, uh, so some of them had been there in the 20s and in the 30s, and they kind of indicated to me that it was a rough place to be, and that there were a few people that were rougher than others. And at this stage, you see, the, the National Army has, a, I suppose, a strength of just, just a few thousand. The vast majority of the vast majority, but certainly more than half of the IRA were anti-treaty. And that was, again, especially the case in the west and the southwest of the country. If they're to protect the state, how are they going to do it? They're not going to do it with the existing forces that they have, so they have to recruit. Uh, given the situation that they're building an army at the very same time as that they're under attack from half of what was their former army, th this was a process that could never be handled smoothly or easily. Uh, and, but the pace of mobilisation is obviously necessary to build an army that can defend the state, but that pace of mobilisation or, or recruitment is also going to break. Obviously, you're not going to be um, checking the character and the ability and the uh, the the suitability of individuals to be soldiers or to fit into a, a disciplined armed force, especially when you're bringing in tens of thousands within months, literally. It will be readily realised that a large proportion of the criminal element found its way into the army. To put the matter bluntly, nearly every criminally disposed person had a gun, either from the government or from Mr de Valera. And needless to say, the government service on account of the pay involved was the more attractive. And in the meantime, the British Army, who were three or four generations living in Athlone, the, 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 the privates, below officer class, from Sergeant Down, they were sent to London and everyone began to laugh at their accents and called them Paddy. <laughs> and they were offered a little pension to get the hell out of the British Army. So they went home to Athlone and they went in and joined the army. And Michael Collins, who of course had been the IRA Director of Intelligence, he's the President of the IRB, uh, he's President of the Provisional Government, or the Head of the Provisional Government, the, the Handover Government, goes out and headhunts these people. And people might be surprised by this, but for example, Collins has this extensive correspondence with the Royal British Legion, who are based on Molesworth Street in Central Dublin, to recruit their people, especially as training officers. One of the results of the reorganisation of January 1923 was the appointment to and commissioning of a number of ex-British officers, non-commissioned officers and men, particularly the latter, and of persons who had never been connected with the IRA. The old IRA men in the army generally objected to the presence of those who had never participated in the national movement, and particularly to those who were regarded as enemies prior to the truce with England. I mean, those who were wise enough at that time, who were in the positions of leadership in the state and leaders, leadership, leadership positions in the uniformed services, they knew, they knew that in order for there to be political accountability, there had to be a certain rigidity within the uniformed services, lest anarchy prevails. So therefore, that was a necessity. These are former guerrillas. They're hardline Irish Republicans. They're quite anti-British very anti-British really in their attitudes. And now they're being asked to work with people who in some cases, especially if they were former police, had served against them in the War of Independence. Or they would also have this perception that the people who went off to fight for Britain during the First World War were traitors and that they should have been, they shouldn't have done that. They should have been at home fighting for Irish freedom. And this is an explosive combination. It's, it's a tension throughout the Civil War. And what you see during the Civil War actually is there's various mutinies in barracks, like in Athlone, there's a very serious situation where people threaten to get shot and the, I the IRA officers, the former IRA officers, drop a list of the British officers they want kicked out of the army because they say they're not politically up to scratch. They also say they're not militarily worth anything, which is probably debatable. I am not an alarmist, but I have no hesitation in saying that unless immediate and drastic action is taken, we are faced with the possibility of a very nasty situation. That the trouble has reached a critical stage is evidenced by the fact that a notice couched in the following terms was recently pasted up in the command mess. 
officers of Athlone Command. Are you willing to work hand in hand with men when three years ago they would have shot you like dogs who burned our villages, tortured our young men and insulted our sisters? It has come to our notice that in all other commands, officers who are black and tans or British soldiers are being dismissed. Are you willing to do what officers in other commands are not? Think and answer, not in words, but in deeds. There was very little time to train. So there's no time for training for a lot of these men. In fact, one of the, Sean McMahon, who was the, the chief of staff for much of the civil, for the civil war, he gives an account later on in, in early 1924 where he, he says that in a lot of occasions, men were being put in uniform and being driven to uh, their barracks or their posts, or certainly the civil war being driven into the city center of Dublin and being taught how to operate a rifle on the way. So I suppose one of the huge challenges for the National Army is that they're trying to create an army at a time when they don't have the time to train the men and they don't have the time to instill any of those kinds of to discipline. And discipline is a massive problem for the National Army all throughout the, the, the Civil War. You'll see multiple cases of shoulders, what would be called friendly fire, either shooting one another uh, or accidentally discharging weapons. Uh, gla now, not only in costume barracks, but they have outposts all around. You have glass and near, near Atlone and the road to Longford. That's like a hotbed of soldiers shooting each other or accidentally shooting themselves. And I think that becomes, and then if you look at their ages, some of them might be 16, they're 17, they're 18, they're guys who've only just joined the army. They have no military experience. They were too young to have taken part, for the most part, in, in the War of Independence. They don't even have that experience. And even if they did, they may never have handled weapons. They have not handled weapons. They obviously, or it seems very likely, they've not received adequate, uh, or if any, training in how to handle these weapons and these, these guys are shooting each other accidentally um, around the country and around that loan. So the National Army loses around eight to 900 people killed in the Civil War, of whom about 300 are killed accidentally by their own side. Um, some of them are murders due to disputes among soldiers, but most of them are people with bad weapons training, basically, who either shoot themselves or shoot their comrades. And this is another consequence, but they're, 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 their um, proficiency as soldiers is often not great. and um, their relationship with the local civilian population tends to deteriorate over time. The conduct of the military on patrol on passing through the country leaves much to be desired. There is an amount of indiscriminate firing which tends to alienate the sympathy of the people and gives rise to adverse criticism which will react unfavourably on the government. The army was becoming distrusted as the state's good guys as frightened, poorly trained young men carried out angry attacks with little regard for the general populace. And sometimes it was hard to see who was worse in this conflict. The cost to the Irish nation of all the havoc and destruction that have taken place in the country is appalling. The cost of the military operations undertaken to break the power of those who have been laying the country waste is enormous. As the Civil War gained momentum and the sense of this destructive fight could last a long time and bankrupt the country, moves were taken that would change the course of this short and brutal conflict. I, you know, I think the death of Collins has a major impact in this and a major bearing in this. The fact that the anti-treaty IRA moved towards the destruction of infrastructure and the fact that I suppose there's, a, there's probably a level of experience there of having been on the other side of a guerrilla war, that this is going to create difficulties for the National Army in terms and in terms for the government in terms of how to create or how to control and how to try to spread or restore law and order. So yeah, I think all of those things feed into the decision to actually begin state executions or begin military tribunals. Um, you know, how the National Army would have gone about its, its role in that, I think that they kept it fairly tight in terms of the people that they were asking to actually execute or to, to form the execution squads themselves, um, but there's very little on that, as you know, there was a, a, an order issued in 1932 to burn a lot of the, the sensitive documents and a lot of the records around how exactly the army would have processed that or how they would have dealt with the, the request. On September 27th, 1922, the Dáil passed by 41 votes to 18, the Public Safety Bill, which allowed military courts the right to impose the sentence of death, the sentence only requiring the signatures of two officers. Labour's Thomas Johnson objected to the bill, saying, We are pretending to govern through this doll. We're supposed to have a government which is responsible to this doll. 
The government hands this responsibility over to an army which is not fitted for this particular kind of work. Entirely unfitted for this particular kind of work. My father then had joined the army because the pro-treaty won the vote. He joined the idea, so he joined in at loan then, so he did. And he was, actually there was a few people from, from the exers, from the, from the war, you know, and they joined the army. It got a bit rough. And when, when the pro-men, well they had to do it, the army was there. They were, went out and they were told to uh, hunt down the, the likes of the IRA. And it got so bad that they were hounded down and were brought into the Athlone barracks. And there was five people on this one. And the, the, the sentence was death. They were to be shot. Irish men to be shot by Irish men. Well, a lot of the guys who are executed are rank and file, so to speak. And it's a message to say that nobody in the anti-treaty forces is safe, that you could be executed if you're caught. Usually in the charges of being in possession of arms or in possession of arms with intent to, to, to do, to fight against the, the, the authorities of the Free State. And um, in, on the 20th of January uh, 1923, you've got five executions in costume barracks. On the night before the killings or the executions in the morning, the firing squad was picked. And the six people, they were all people who were in, had been in the British Army. So the more, that night they went and they saw them in the chapel, there's five of them, and uh, there's, they looked and they said, and one said to the other, we call him Mick. He said, Mick, just look down, he said. We're expected to shoot Irish men tomorrow. Right, we're after coming back from the front after killing and trying to kill Germans. And one said to the other, he said, well, I'll tell you one thing, I'm not going to shoot an Irish man tomorrow morning. So seemingly, the signal was for them in the firing squad that when the order come up, you take two steps backwards. And when the order come at you, fire, the boys, two boys pull back. There was pandemonium. Now the men were shot, and the two men who didn't. And there was this, and there was that. Oh, General Sean McEwen. McEwen, he was, uh, he was pro at that time. And it was said, I don't know how true this, but it was said that my father and his mate could have been shot because it was an act of treason to disobey an order. But then I was told then the reason that they weren't shot was McEwen as well would have, we're in enough of trouble at now, we're not going to shoot two more men on account. And they were labelled heroes in that loan. He never told me. I, I, were, I got it from David's father. Many different sources. Yeah, and I got it from his father, who would have been my brother. Within one year of the emergency legislation, the government had executed 81 and imprisoned over 12,000, which caused great resentment and weakened support for the Irish Free State. Even though it's hard to tell what was the general reaction amongst the public in Athlone at this time. But say, the media supported the executions, the Westmead uh, Independent, Westmead Examiner. Support, now they regretted the fact that they happened, but they said, look, the government has no option but to take these, um, to take these drastic actions. And drastic was a, a word that was used a lot. The government is determined to put down this revolt against democracy regardless of the cost. Let no man be deceived. If anyone continues in this unnatural war upon his own people after the expiration of the stated period of amnesty, he must be prepared to pay the price in full. The National Army has big advantages in the Civil War. One of them is size, so they're funded by, the first of all, the Irish Exchequer and by the British, you know, subsidised in the end by the British government, and they're able to recruit 60,000 people. Um, they are able to arm them all with modern weapons and they have heavy weapons where they need them. So they need them kind of at the start of the Civil War, artillery and so on. But they also have airplanes for, um, mostly for reconnaissance. They also do some bombing missions and so on. They have machine guns, mortars, etc. where they need them. The other side has, you know, very irregular supplies of weapons and funding. The funding they have to basically extract from the population. But regardless of sentiment, running a guerrilla war was draining on the anti-treaty side. 
as seen by this comment from Mary Comerford in a book called Survivors. Big columns now were a risk and could not be fed. Of the half dozen houses in any one neighbourhood which might have been sheltered then before, only one was open to them now and it was well watched and spied upon. A column now was four men, short of ammunition, hiding in a dripping dugout. The temptations to cease to plan operations, to give up, to go home were obvious. The Republican army was disintegrating like snow on a sunny day. The irregular organisations in all areas are practically broken. Their ranks are thinning and even superhuman efforts on the part of the leaders would not restore to the rank and file that spirit they once boasted. In more than one battalion area, individual surrender of arms and ammunition have been accepted. Their only request was to maintain secrecy. This is significant of their broken spirit. The anti-treaty faction of the IRA, or Irregulars, knowing they probably couldn't win, ordered its forces to stand down on the 30th of April 1923. Almost immediately, the discussions began, for financial reasons, to downsize the army from 55,000 to closer to 20,000, with more reductions in the pipeline. This massive demobilization only a year after the major recruitment, in the middle of recession, was probably not a good move. Now it became necessary when an army of 50,000 was being reduced to 12 or 14,000 to demobilise a lot of good officers. It did. And they had to go? Yes. And they naturally had a grievance at having to go? Yes. And the demobilisation, and the government sources say this, is very close to causing a second civil war, which is... Partly political, because the former IRA element of the army say, you know, where's our republic? Where's our stepping stone? You know, we we fought for the British Empire. That's not what we signed up for. But it, really what it is, is about who gets the jobs. Unemployment due to demobilisation is not very noticeable, as the majority of discharged officers and men belong to the farming class. But it is anticipated this will be reversed when the men belonging to towns who are unskilled go on the market. Sean McKeown writes to, um, writes to the government in uh, late 1923 saying this has been handled very badly, uh, it's a mess basically. Uh, so McKeown, obviously we've yet loan focus here, but I think that's, that attitude is replicated by senior commanders around, around the country. The requirement of demobilisation, then another reorganisation of the army, pay restrictions and then suddenly a recruitment drive all of this in the middle of a mass unemployment would lead to an angry reaction from the men felt hard done by by the state. Rumours of conspiracies and secret societies grew. Malkahi is standing by the IRB and wants all jobs in the army allotted to its members. O'Higgins, on the other hand, stands for the Empire and is anxious to get rid of most of the old IRA element and put ex-British Army officers into most of the positions of authority in the Free State Army. So the head of the army is former IRA, Richard Mulcahy and, and his, his clique, basically. And the high positions are all held by former IRA people. That said, they really prefer to have in the mid-level the former British Army people. And this causes massive trouble because they're the ones they want to keep on. They only want to keep on the ex-IRA who are reliable to them. They want to kick out a lot of the ones who had done the most fighting in the guerrilla war against the British, the War of Independence, and in many cases had done most of the hard fighting in the early stages of the Civil War, where the fighting is, is, is hardest. We'd say the 28th of February, they took over Custer Barracks in Atlone, right? Within three months, you had the start of the Civil War, which lasted for 11 months. And that was a tragic time in our history. Uh, there was atrocity upon atrocity perpetrated by both sides, by both sides. And the army had to, uh, um, expanded to 55,000 people. And then post-Civil War, you had the difficulty and particularly the challenges in the officer corps in the Old Comrades Association of 1924 when the order came to reduce the size of the, of the army from 55,000 initially to 23,000. So obviously, you know, in the Hungary post 
uh, First World War formation of the state. I mean, economic survival was part of the issue. The, you would have to say, uh, pay and conditions, which is a very big thing in a peacetime army. You know what I mean? When you're not active, uh, pay and conditions are very much in your mind. So the conditions would have been uh, harsh, as we know at the time, very basic. Uh, the pay uh, would be a problem. And so there's very nearly, uh, there is a mutiny in the army, so a lot of these officers go missing, they take weapons, they actually approach the anti-treatyites to see if they'll join together. So it's, it, it's nipped in the bud because Mokahi has them arrested, and then there's, Mokahi himself is forced to resign. And it's probably in hindsight not viewed as, as serious as it could have been, you know, it's one of those might have been. There, no, there was never a mutiny, well, there was, let, let's say there were animated discussions, but certainly the, um, the, the state felt threatened. By what's happened. I am certain it is only human for officers and men demobilized to feel a little bit sore, but I do not believe for a moment it would be more than a very small number of officers, a very small percentage, who would do anything to the prejudice of the country for their own purposes. Talk of a mutiny in the papers looked like it might have spooked the political class, as they could see in various parts of Europe states that were struggling with military takeovers. So you could see where the impetus came to control the army by reducing it to a bare minimum and saving money at the same time. The Westmead Independent compares the mutiny of 1924 to um, potential, uh, or it's looking at Italy and Mussolini, and it because the Westmead Independent gave ample coverage to foreign affairs uh, at the time, and it's looking at that, that and it's saying, look, the army, if the army is allowed to dictate to the civilian authorities, that is fascism, and we can't have, it, it, it says the phrase, it might be suitable for Italy, but it's not suitable for Ireland. And it's the bottom line in that editorial is that um, this, the, the army must be a subordinate to the, to the government and the civil authorities. There was that revolutionary zeal in the place. Of course it was an influence, but I would say it, the, 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 straight, the, the state felt threatened that the army would take over and intervene because there's nothing, nothing more dangerous than idle soldiers well, and, 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 and officers who are about to be disbanded. What does it all come back to ultimately? Money. And the, 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 once the civil war was won, the state's first goal was to, its first interaction with the army effectively was to downsize it. And it's never been upsized, you could say, or it's never been reinvigorated. Very soon after the first massive demobilisation, the government decided to try and cut even more off the budget of the Irish Army. Their thinking, and one that seems to persist even today, is that we don't really need an army for anything other than internal control. If we were ever invaded, we will simply call on the assistance of our British neighbour. An interesting idea, given that we'd only recently finished fighting to get them out of Ireland. The army or the defence forces has been infinitely more loyal to the state than the state has been loyal to the defence forces, right? And probably one of the greatest strategic errors that the defence forces has made. One is that they confused respect with the flattery, that's the first thing. And secondly, they made a virtue out of silence and anonymity. There's no virtue in silence and anonymity. The idea that a professional and trained armed force was somehow both costly and dangerous to the state, is one, I would contend, that was born in the turbulent times of 1922-24 to 24, and has persisted in political thinking ever since. The Irish Army today is not funded to any degree as a modern, well-equipped fighting force, although we'd like to think it is. The financial considerations were paramount in the early 1920s and the army never recovered. Uh, and I don't think much thought was given to it in subsequent decades. And I think you could bring in arguments such as, we don't want a militarised society and these are the current south and we don't want... Fed. But I think the primary considerations were, this isn't something that we should devote resources to because we've limited resources and they'd just be wasted going to the army. I think a lot of the issue for 
the defence forces for its past century has been that there's never been an actual properly defined defence policy by the Irish government until about 2000 or so. And even at that point, when the policy was defined, it was never actually funded to the point that it needed to be or should have been funded. It's been allowed to evolve in a way that has had zero coherence and direction from the government and it has to find its own way and usually with resources and, and, fu and funding which is nowhere near the level that it should be but that's a story across the entire public sector usually. So I mean I think the events of 1922 to 24, the conduct of the Civil War and especially the attempt at mutiny at the end of the Civil War did set a precedent for the way Irish governments thought about the army and its role in the future. So the important thing was the army would be small, would be politically controllable and would not cost too much money.